The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. The lake always has snow, and there's so many different areas of snowmobile. Whether you're on the lake, whether you're in pines, whether you're in deciduous forest, going through some, a few swamps, it's just gorgeous. And trying to get a bison to stand still doesn't sound real hard, but you should try it. It's not real easy. You can't make a bison do something that they don't want to do. It's not this look, but don't touch crab. And I think part of it is the fact that I have a great time doing it, and I suspect that it shows. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in western Minnesota. And by Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Lake of the Woods, 1,679 square miles and millions of walleye. But did you know that it's also home to hundreds of miles of groomed snowmobile trails? While Lake of the Woods is a known destination for ice fishing, the area also features trails that wind through the pristine northern Minnesota landscape. We'll journey through state forests and across the big lake to visit the northernmost point in the contiguous 48 states, the Northwest Angle where we'll hit trails that most Minnesotans don't even know about. And of course, while we're there, we'll drop a line and see if anything's biting. There we go, baby. Minnesotans take pride in their ability to handle the brutal stretch of cold weather each winter. And it's easy to see how when you're on an 87-mile snowmobile trail that runs from Bedette to Big Falls while only crossing two major highways. 90% of it goes through, through state property and there's some swamp trails. There's, uh, there's Some of it is swamp, some of it is, is high timber ground. And there's three different shelters along the, the trail to, to, uh, to stop and, and take a break or cook a bird or a dog or, or what have you. And, it's a day-long trek if you're going to do it, but make sure your tank's full. Along with Todd Barnes, we'd be riding with Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism and Jamie Dittman from Brainerd, Minnesota. I was surprised how many trails there were, and there was no people on them, and they were very well man maintained. Wide trails, um, no traffic compared to the Lake Central Minnesota where I normally ride. It's easy to overlook the snowmobiling at Lake of the Woods when the fishing is so good. Snowmobiling is totally not, not even thought about ice fishing thought about this time of year and that's why you know uh, with with hundreds of miles of groomed stake trails up here people don't realize how great it is you know we're not the cosmopolitan snow wheel area consequently we don't get the traffic yet we got the, the beautiful trails we have an extended season both early and late because of where we're located um, the lake always has snow and there's so many different areas of snowmobile, whether you're on the lake, whether you're in pines, whether you're in deciduous forest, going through some few swamps, it's just gorgeous. And the wildlife you see, just incredible. The remote scenery is only part of the fun along these trails. Uh, so the Igloo Bar is on the ice. It's uh, put right in front of Zippel Bay, and in fact, Zippel Bay Resort puts it out. It's a thousand square feet, it's a bar on the ice, so they get a full bar, partial hot menu, 
They got two big screen TVs and you can actually fish inside the bar. I mean, each year walleyes and big pike are caught out of the bar. One of the more unique trails at Lake of the Woods is a 42 mile staked run from the south end to the northwest angle. It's staked, it's groomed, it's a Grantonade trail, yep, uh, uh, it's, it's maintained on a regular basis as are you know, the, the trails that are on the land around here. We made it to the northwest angle. This is the northernmost point in the contiguous 48 states. So you, you, to get any further north in America here, you'd have to be in Alaska. We snowmobiled across Lake of the Woods to get here, and there's groomed trails up here in the northwest angle that we're gonna check out now. So how far from Canada are we right now? Oh, about five miles. Five miles. Yeah. We're way up, folks. Yeah. Thanks for taking us out today. All right, you're welcome. Appreciate it. Back to the trail. The angle is that little tip of Minnesota that sticks up into Canada. It was actually a mapping error back in the day. You know, they thought that that was the start of the Mississippi River. So you know what, If you when you go to the Northwest Angle, you can either stay in Minnesota and go over the lake, which means in the summer, of course, by, uh, by boat, or you can go by ice like this time of year, either by snowmobile like we did, or there's actually a bombardier, a, a transport service that takes you back and forth to the resorts that they angled from the resorts in the south and vice versa. The other option is to drive around. When you drive around and, and drive up to the Northwest Angle, in fact, we have an ice road coming right to our resort on an island right now. But when you drive up here, um, you actually drive into Canada, into Manitoba, then you enter back into Minnesota when you get up to the Angle. Two ways to do it, Part of it depends upon if you have passports and uh, you know if you want to take a little extra time. We came to snowmobile around Lake of the Woods, but a trip here just wouldn't be complete without tipping a jig with a shiner and seeing how the walleye bite was. You know, it's kind of nice to break up the trip and you can make a five to seven day trip up here now, fish for a few days. And I know people like to fish a lot, but after a couple days of hammering fish, it'd be nice to go for a ride and see some areas. And if you don't have the passport stuff, you can just pick a week and ride up here in Stone Mills. You don't have to deal with all that. You still have nice lodging and nice amenities. So, yeah, it would be definitely a thing to think about. Perch. Ooh, big perch. Right up. There's a demo you're asking about. Yeah. Look at that perch. Woo! We've been perch fishing a lot this year. I've not caught anything near that size right there. Oh, fish on. Ooh, there's got shoulders. Good one. Yeah. Call it. What do you got? Oh, nice walleye. All right. This one is right on the bottom. So. Nice walleye. Wow. There we go, baby. Look at that. Oh, one. That's yeah. what you like to see coming up the hole. Good job, Jamie. Nice fish. Wow. Heck yeah. That's what we're up here for, right there. Those walleyes. Beautiful fish that look like a fun fight. Yeah. Nice job. Joe, tell us about fishing at the Northwest Angle and how it can be different than uh, the south end of the lake. Yeah, well, you know, so, so Lake of the Woods is made up of three different areas. You got the Rainy River that feeds Lake of the Woods, that's one area. Then you got the great big open water of Big Traverse Bay. And, you know, Big Traverse Bay is almost like a, a great lake. Uh, it's, it's 30 miles north-south by 25 miles east-west. Big water loaded with millions of walleyes and saugers. And that's a little different because it's a whole bunch of wide open mud that gets as deep as about 36 feet with occasional reefs. Well now when you get up to the northwest angle, it's actually where the islands area begins. It's where the Canadian Shield begins. So now, like right now, we're fishing off of a reef. There's reefs and islands and underwater points and rock mud transitions and it's just so much more uh, structure. And actually, you know, from an ice fishing perspective, you will catch a higher percentage of walleyes up here than you will in the south end because of the structure. There we go. Other rod. Other rod. We got a double going here. Got another nice walleye up here in Lake of the Woods. One for the frying pan.
Chase, come on, come on. We got some action Jackson, aren't we? Some fish coming through, yeah. Well, you do got a back ace, so I'm away from you when I jigged it. Yeah, there's one down there. Boy, good one. Oh boy. Swimming around, isn't he? Can see Power! Eel power. <laughs> see if I get that eel yeah. power up here. <laughs> So this, this is kind of a, it's not really a respected fish, Joe, but I love eel pollen. Yeah. Freshwater cod, burbot, poor man's lobster. I mean, there's a lot of names for them, but technically this is a freshwater cod. I like them. I think they're cool looking fish. Some people don't think they're very attractive. I think, you know, they're so old. I think they have a neat look to them. They're fun to, fun to catch. Of course, I thought that was a big walleye, so you're always a little disappointed when it's not a big walleye. But they're fun to catch. They're delicious to eat, and uh, they're, they're neat to look at. Hey, thanks, Joe. So next time you want to adventure to northern Minnesota, consider bringing the sleds along and seeking out the solitude among the North Woods, in addition to enjoying the famous fishing at Lake of the Woods. Bison are North America's largest mammal. They are really the last remaining of those um, massive mammals. So I dug out my trusty buck knife and I started digging and popped this out. Tens of millions of bison roamed North America before European settlers arrived. They were built to withstand harsh prairie winters with long coats of hair over their head and shoulders. Native Americans depended on bison for protein and used their bones to make tools and their hides for shelter and clothing. But after Europeans arrived, these seemingly indestructible creatures nearly disappeared. Efforts to reintroduce bison to the American Plains started in 1907, when the Bronx Zoo released 15 in an Oklahoma preserve. Those efforts continue today at the Minnesota Zoo. The Minnesota Zoo has rare animals throughout the world. Normally, you wouldn't think of bison as being a rare animal, but as it turns out, they, they kind of are. Ever since Lewis and Clark went across this country in their explorations, they just, you know, they discovered the bison and, and uh, had estimates of, of large numbers of these guys running around the prairies, 20 million plus. And uh, that was in the early 1800s. And in about 100 years, Americans pretty much drove them down to the brink of extinction due to the fact that early conservationists want to save the species and, and zoos uh, save, help save the species by breeding them in captivity and they released them back out into national parks. And now we have bison in the millions again. From a distance, modern bison look and act like their ancestors. But upon closer inspection and DNA testing, researchers discovered that almost all carry cattle DNA. Some of the crossbreeding was accidental and some intentional to breed faster and save the species. Many people ask, does it really matter? If they look like bison, uh, you know, is that okay? And as it turns out with the latest research has shown that bison with cattle DNA present grow slower and attain smaller sizes than pure bison. And there also may be some behavioral changes there as well. That got the attention of the Minnesota Zoo and the Minnesota DNR, and we formed a partnership in 2012 to work towards bison conservation. The DNR manages a herd of about 80 bison at Blue Mound State Park. In 2015, in partnership with the zoo, they released 11 bison in Minneopa State Park, where there will eventually be a herd of 30 to 40 animals. Tony Fisher, who directs the zoo's animal collections, says these are the only bison herds in Minnesota known to be genetically pure. Since 2012, nine calves have been born at the zoo and moved to Minneopa or Blue Mound State Parks when a year and a half old. They will live 20 to 30 years and cows will produce calves well into their 20s. The DNR and zoo have removed any animals from these herds where they detected cattle DNA. Now they're working to diversify genetics by bringing in purebred bulls and frozen embryos from national parks like Yellowstone, Badlands, 
and Teddy Roosevelt. One goal is to eliminate all cattle DNA as, as much as possible within our bison herd and uh, to try and breed for genetic diversity. We want a healthy herd of bison, and to do that, they have to be uh, genetically diverse. Genetic testing is done at Texas A&M University. To get samples, the zoo's Diana Weinhart draws blood and pulls hair samples from the animal's tails. That's no easy task. And trying to get a bison to stand still doesn't sound real hard, but you should try it. It's not real easy. You can't make a bison do something that they don't want to do. We have a, a kind of a chute similar to what some cattle people use that we can use for management, but they're kind of enclosed and so we can just kind of stick our arms through a, a space and we pull out the hair and there's teeny little follicles on the end of it. And that's actually what we use to do the DNA testing. Purebred bison grow to about six feet in height. A female weighs up to 1,500 pounds and a male 2,000 pounds or a ton. A bull moose, by comparison, weighs around 1,000 pounds. Bison are North America's largest mammal. They are really the last remaining of those um, massive mammals that used to roam, like the woolly mammoths and things like here that roam this continent. You're talking about one of the hardiest animals uh, on the face of the planet, I think. For as big as they are, they run 35 miles an hour. They can jump six feet. You know, they can jump long ways, 11 feet. I mean, they're not something that you want to mess with. <laughs> the bison range at Minneopa State Park is about 335 acres. There, the mega herbivores graze on native grasses like prairie drop seed and little blue stem. The selective grazing promotes diverse habitats and along with prescribed burns that control invasive species, the bison are helping to restore the park's native habitat. When we look at the prairie, and especially in this middle part of North America, um, fire and bison played an important role on what this um, ecosystem looked like. Minnesota Zoo and the Minnesota DNR are committed to preserving this species a bison uh, as pure as, as possible, keeping them looking like bison and genetically healthy and acting like bison for now and well into the futures. And that's what I think the visitors enjoy is seeing bison just like they've been for hundreds of years. Watch out for the aqua invaders. These innocent looking plants and fish might be handsome and flashy, but they're choking habitats in the land of sky blue waters. Whether we invited them here or they hitchhiked in, we're out to identify these aquatic invasive species and stop their spread. This segment was brought to you by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Candio High, Big Stone, and Yellow Medicine Counties. Every year, hundreds of students of all ages are drawn to an old schoolhouse in New Ulm, Minnesota that now holds the Riverside History and Nature Learning Center. There, curator Ron Boldwin leads explorations of river life through bones, pelts, shells, and skulls. His humor and hands-on approach is popular with kids. It's not this look, but don't touch crap. And I think part of it is the fact that I have a great time doing it, and I suspect that it shows, and rather than lecturing them, I'm trying to have a good time with them. I probably never outgrew it. I, <laughs> the ones that love the wildlife and stuff, that's the way I was at that age, and I love to handle things. In September, Prairie sportsmen visited Riverside to see Ron and his volunteers welcome about 45th and 6th graders from Walnut Grove Elementary School. 
It's raining, so outdoor lessons must be brought inside. But there are no complaints. There's plenty to see, touch, and experience indoors. The students are divided into three groups that rotate through rooms packed full of River Ecology lessons. John Nisley demonstrates in Viroscape, a microcosm of a watershed that shows how life's discards end up in our rivers. Here we have dog poo, we have soil from construction, we have a ton of fertilizer in the lawns and at the golf course. What do you think is going to happen when it rains on this landscape? Where is that water going to flow? Down to here? DNR naturalist Scott Kadelka leads students on an exploration of the Minnesota River Valley's wildlife, from butterflies to bison. What do they use the tail for? Flying flies. Very good. The student's favorite stop is Ron's Museum of Artifacts, where he encourages students to ask questions and use all of their senses as they explore river life. Ron has been a student of the Minnesota River for more than a quarter of a century. He studies and photographs the river's rich treasures along Tatanka Bluffs, a scenic river corridor from Granite Falls to New Ulm, with massive rock outcrops, towering bluffs, waterfalls, and an abundance of wildlife. You go in and you'd swear you were in the Rockies somewhere. I think that's why people love to canoe it and to boat on it, because you really feel like you're away from it all, even though you're not. While Ron was out photographing these natural wonders, he literally stumbled onto his passion for collecting river artifacts. I'm a nature photographer. I spent 20, roughly 26 years doing a photo study of the Minnesota River Basin. And in the process, I would walk the creeks and I'd walk the rivers. And I stopped one day along a creek where I spent a lot of time, took a break to have a sandwich and a pop, and lo and behold, I was looking at this root that was growing out of the riverbank. And I thought, why is that thing tapered like this? It was kind of weird. So I dug out my trusty buck knife and I started digging and popped this out. I took it over to Mankato and took it to MSU, the anthropology professor. And he looked at it and I saw his eyes light up and he took me to his stock room and he had at least 30 plus horns there and he said it's definitely a buffalo but it's far bigger than anything I have so then I was a little more impressed and he guesstimated probably by the calcification on it and by the size when you compare it to the others here that uh, it's at least three to five thousand years old so that was a great start and then I started deliberately looking for interesting items and I started, once you start hunting for it, you develop an eye like a mushroom hunter. Ron quickly amassed an impressive collection of bones, pelts, shells, and skulls. In 2011, he was offered space for his artifacts in a schoolhouse located in New Alms' Goose Town neighborhood, between the railroad tracks and the river. The name Goose Town was coined in the early days when Bohemian immigrants in the neighborhood raised large flocks of geese. It was a colorful neighborhood, not only physically, but there's a lot of colorful characters. The former school held its last classes in 1942. Then it was used for everything from apartments to a pottery studio. Today, the city is renovating the historic building that welcomes more than 1,500 visitors annually. School groups come from a four county area surrounding New Ulm, from kindergartners to seniors. Ron enjoys sharing his passion with all ages, but he does have his favorites. When you give me fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and today we had fourth and fifth, I'm in pig heaven. They are just, they're knowledgeable. It just amazes me what they know sometimes. And they are so curious. And they aren't worried about impressing their peers. They're willing to share with you, talk with you, and they don't feel like they're making a fool of themselves by giving you a wrong answer. They are not inhibited whatsoever, so I love it. And you can tell this is my baby. I just love doing this. It's, it's, it's really neat to do. Hopefully some of these kids are going to hang on it through a lifetime just like I did. And I'm hoping to create at least a few of those little monsters like myself in here.
Have a question for Prairie Sportsman? Contact us at prairiesportsman at pioneer.org or hashtag AskPS on Facebook and Twitter. For more on Prairie Sportsman and to view episodes online, go to prairiesportsman.org. Thanks for tuning in and be sure to get outdoors this week. for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in western Minnesota. And by Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected.